Tina Simone's musical repertoire is about blending a kind of artistic, racial, gender, sexual freedom. And by the time contemporary listeners and artists discover Nina Simone, they're hearing this unrelenting demand for freedom. It was never that easy to sell race, to sell the idea of we all have to be one. Almost up there with Louis Armstrong as an ambassador. And Louis Armstrong had the government behind him. Nina didn't have the government behind her, so she was alone in her crusade. Mississippi, goddamn! And I was sort of shrinking because I didn't know how they were going to take it. I was with her the first time she met Dr. King, and he walks up to her and she walks up to, to him, and she doesn't say, how do you do, or anything. She says, I'm not nonviolent. <laughs> he says, okay, sister, you don't have to be. <laughs> we are sold this notion of a standard of beauty that we really could not attain. And here was this woman who was totally defying all of that. White people talk about having been scared of Nina Simone in the 1960s. For many years, she tended not to show up in stories about civil rights and jazz study scholarship too because she didn't fit into the neat stories that people told about this period of time. It was the mini, the mini hers, the mini Nina Simone. She had many, multiple personalities. She would talk about how she wanted to play like little girls. She wanted to play games and hopscotch. And she felt like she never was able to do that because she was bred to be a classical pianist. I loved her, I liked her, I loved her. Nobody could be with Nina for long. This is the truth. Because she was overpowering. She was too much. My being a human being and an imperfect human being has made me ill-equipped to deal with the talent that God gave me. Because I mean it that if I had my choice, I would never have gotten Nina, this brings me to something that you once said. And uh, you, you said that music is a gift and a burden. And obviously the gift and the burden still there. Mm -hmm.